in for Betty Feibusch this evening. So welcome to the uh, Youth Education Cultural Affairs Committee of Community Board 2, Brooklyn. I'm just gonna read a quick opening statement um, from the, for all community boards. And so just to let you know that um, we are in order, we are being recorded as, as Taya mentioned for public access and archiving. Uh, and this is in accordance with New York State open meeting laws. Um, it is practice to conduct our meetings with all of our committee members' cameras on. So we, if you can, uh, we do ask that you have your cameras on. Public attendees, of course, we encourage you to leave your cameras on, uh, especially if you're going to uh, be speaking this evening. All attendees, please keep your microphones muted. Uh, we know you might be multitasking, so just if you're not speaking, please be muted. And uh, let's, you know, we, of course, want to maintain appropriate discussion voting process. And so um, you may hear that um, topics are open for comment by different people. And usually we start with committee members first, board members at large, and then the general public for comment. And if you have any questions that fall outside of those um, public comments, we encourage you please chat, uh, put them in the chat for us, and we'll address them as time permits. Also, feel free to always email our district office, Taya. Um, she's amazing. She will get back to you, I think, within 72 hours or so is, is usually the uh, email. Uh, and and last, last to wrap it up, just uh, we have a commitment to provide access for all of our neighbors, all right, regardless of any physical ability or limitation. So if you require any accommodation, please do reach out to the district office 72 hours in advance. Um, Taya, do we have any accommodations this evening that were requested? We do not. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and those speaking, just please, you know, speak clearly for uh, everybody. And we ask our presenters when you're sharing, please just to read your titles of the slides and uh, any of the images explain what they are for folks. So uh, we'll get into our roll call, our welcomes, um, and we'll uh, for our committee members. So again, I am Nick Ferreira, one of the uh, committee members and board members. And I guess we can go around and how about I call on somebody and maybe you call on a committee member. So, uh, Ellis, you want to welcome yourself? Good evening, everybody. I'm Ellis Scope. I'm a member of the uh, of this committee and I'm calling on Rachel. Hi, um, I'm Rachel. Um, I'm a member of this committee. Um, calling on Leroy. Hi, my name is Leroy. I'm a member of Community Board 2, as well as a member of the committee. And I'll pass it to Santia. Hi, I'm Santia Polisi. I'm a committee member and board member. And I'm going to pass it to Sam. Hi, my name is Samantha Johnson. I am a board member. Thank you. How do we do? Do we get all of our... Committee members. Awesome. Thank you. For the, thank you for the thumbs up, Taya. Okay, so um, at this time, then I, uh, if anybody, if everybody got a chance to see the shared uh, agenda, any opposition to the agenda this evening? Adopt the agenda. Are we good. Okay. Hearing nothing, then we've got our agenda for the evening adopted. Um, and for the February 2023, I think we have, are they still coming in, Taya? Nothing to approve this evening for minutes? Oh, my apologies. The link is, if it's not in the agenda, it will be in a few minutes. Okay. It had TBD, and I know we're, we still are looking for a secretary, so plug for that. Um, but, okay, so we'll um, get those in the chat. There they are. All right, so as always, if you check over previous minutes, any um, comments you wanna make, if you see any errors or corrections, you could let uh, the board office know and we'll make sure to take care and fix uh, the minutes to accurately reflect what occurred. Um, all right, so we'll move on next to open session for public comment on the adopted agenda. So for our um, visitors here, our neighbors who are here, uh, turn it over to you for any uh, comment on our agenda for this evening. Oh, 
Right. Hearing none, we have two presenters this evening, so we're excited. We have an opportunity for you to hear a presentation and, of course, um, have some questions, and we'll hopefully um, get some answers. And first, we have from uh, the Department of Education, we've been talking a little bit about attendance and chronic absenteeism, something that has come up. So we have um, Ms. Wallace Anderson, District 13 Attendance Administrator, I believe, uh, and we also have, is it Okay, just Miss Bishop, I didn't want to um, mispronounce your hyphenated name that we have on the agenda. So, um, principal of 287. So, welcome. Thank you both so much for being here. And turn it over to you, um, and the floor is yours. You have a presentation to share. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear our presentation on chronic absenteeism. I'm going to ask Sylvia just to greet everyone as I get the share presentation, because I know she has to move quickly. Okay, I need to be added as a co-host, I think, the previous one. Thank you so much. My apologies, I'm using my phone um, and that is correct. I do only have a few minutes to speak. Um, so, well, thank you for having us come in and uh, share about this very important topic. Thank you. So, as you know, District 13, um, we are addressing the chronic absenteeism problem. So I wanna share what that actually looks like. So overall, chronic absenteeism is when students are absent more than 10% of the year. Um, students that are absent at least 18 days are considered chronically absent. We know that this is a trigger and an issue because students that enter into the third grade have difficulties with reading, sixth graders struggle with coursework, and we're almost guaranteed that if a child has frequent absences, whether it's because of sickness, whether it's because of challenges at home, um, issues with transportation, commute, or financial needs, that they would long, more than likely be off track when it comes to graduation in high school. I'm gonna share the link to this video because I know we did a run with the audio. And in this video, you're gonna see Hedy Chung. A lot of our resources and supports we've gotten from attendancework.org. They've done a lot of research around how communities can come together around this work. There's an excellent piece that's done in Connecticut called the LEAP program, where the community came together during the pandemic and literally knocked on doors or you know neighborhoods came together mm -hmm. and housing authority um, associates came together just to help and build this team um, around attendance. The reasons, strong economy, better education, safer communities. We know that when kids are in our care, and I'm speaking of course as a principal, when they're here, we know that they're protected for six hours and 50 minutes. And with extended day programs, early arrival at 745 and then extended day into six o'clock. We're guaranteed that kids are in our care. We're guaranteed that there's a nurse on site and we're guaranteed that they're getting the instructional supports that they need. So this is just to highlight some of those areas that I spoke a little bit about when we talk about 18 days, 36 days, extreme chronic absenteeism, 45 days, 54 plus. Some of these numbers were relevant, especially during the pandemic. Um, previously, chronic absenteeism, you, you were able to- Recording in progress. I'm sorry. One out of 10 students were considered chronically absent. Post-pandemic, that number has increased to one out of three students are chronically absent. So I just wanna stop right here just to see if there's any questions around chronic absenteeism before I go any further. So first, just a reminder, um, any committee members with any questions? Opening up to anybody else? Yes, I have a question. Ms. Okay. Uh, yes, um, 
which grades are most impacted by absenteeism? Is it the elementary, or the older kids? Who, which, where is the greatest uh, absentee is that uh, issue? Mm -hmm. Well, honestly, it's across the it's across the board. Um, previously, prior to the shutdown, the city really tracked uh, daily attendance as opposed to chronic absenteeism. So, you can have a high um, daily attendance rate, but still have chronic absenteeism be a challenge. Um, so I know this year we've seen a lot of students in the 3K pre-K classrooms that are absent, but there's a population or a, a trend in every school, in every district across the city. That's why the city has, has set a goal to reduce their chronic absenteeism school uh, citywide to 30%. Um, and last year we ended the year in the 40% range. And so it's a huge goal because it is widespread. It's not any one particular grade, one particular type of school, not even one particular uh, district or uh, socioeconomic grouping. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Um, and as Sylvia was presenting the goals, um, I just wanted to highlight those so you can see them. When you look at District 13 specifically, we're in alignment to the citywide goal, 93%, and we're currently working on reducing it to 37%. Um, the mayor has done an initiative with the chancellor to have district attendance coordinators, which is Sylvia's role, to again address chronic absenteeism. So here we have some of the, um, the data, uh, most recent data. So citywide in February, the chronic absentee rate was 34.2%, and that is going down. So in the early March, it was 33.8%. I'm very proud to say that in District 13, we are on track and very, very close to achieving our annual goal. In February, we were at 38.9%, and we celebrated that. But at the beginning of this month, we were down to 37.2%, so only two tenths of a percentage point away from our goal. And of course, we're hoping and striving to exceed the goal that we set out at the beginning of the year. So sorry, I sped through that. Um, the implications. So we know there's just by servicing, serving parents and keeping logs um, and developing systems and structures to be able to identify students that come in late, identify students that are have chronic absenteeism or on borderline. So we try to prevent before they become chronic. Um, large issues, the largely it lands in a space of sickness, illness, um, absences, especially post pandemic. Um, families are feeling that if a child is sick, that they keep them home to monitor. What we're also finding is although they keep them home, there is not an urgent care response, meaning they'll do self-care as opposed to immediately going to the doctor um, to find out what is actually wrong and then address it to reduce the number of days of absences. Now, the data that I'm presenting to you is a little data because it's pre-pandemic, but you get a scope of where we are located has one of the highest asthma rates in Brooklyn. And it's because of our location. PS287 specifically is right at the winding end of the BQE. And so 67.8, we all have high asthma rates, sicknesses, allergies, and they largely tend to go to hospitalization because parents do do self-care. We do have asthma plans. Nurses are in position um, to support and doctors come in to support as well. But we're still struggling with this idea of, you know, my child is sick, the nebulizer. These are the things that are impacting attendance. And I just want to remind you, increased absences equals increased learning loss. Any questions so far before, you know, I share what we're doing and how you can help? Alice? Alice yes, thank, yeah, 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 I did. Takes me a minute. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, thank you for your presentation so far. I was just curious, you say that you have nurses mm -hmm. and uh, parents are still keeping uh, the children home. 
And I'm wondering, do kid, do students have access to the nebulizer in school or mm -hmm. is it, that is available? Okay. It is available and it's a nursing plan. So we have to leverage the big elephant in the room. Going through a pandemic and seeing so such catastrophe and knowing that it started off with a simple cold. Parents are in the space of keeping their children safe and are slowly coming to the understanding that they're safe in the building, right? After so many variants, so many, you know, different strategies that we've used from situation, we're now beginning to trust that leg, but it's been challenging just to get that thought out. Uh, and, and if I may, one more question, then I'll stop on, for this minute. Um, and then I, 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 I guess you, the parent coordinator, is working with the parents as well to kind of help them think and process, um, uh, process all that this that the world has gone through, that they personally have gone through, and to figure out a path forward. Well, is I want to. Yes and no. I want to say yes, because parent coordinators do their role. What's a stronger leg is our social work team. So we mm -hmm. have social workers on staff. Our social work team has a social work internship leg that they partnered with different colleges to come in and to provide those interventions. When it comes to early childhood, as Ms. Wallace Anderson has shared, um, there are 3K, pre-K early childhood social workers that do parent workshops to help support. So it's coming along slowly. Those conversations are coming, but it may just be as simple as having a team, you know, maybe a team within the condo that says, okay, let's all go together at this time. We're going to meet at such and such apartment on the first floor. It may be as simple as that. Thank you. Okay. All righty. And I miss your voice, Sylvia. So I don't know if you want to do what we are doing and then I'll do it. Yeah, sure. No problem. So what are we doing? So Part of my job is to support schools in addressing chronic absenteeism and bringing back the families and the students to school. So we even we're building, fostering, and maintaining the relationships with families. We're looking at data regularly to identify those students who are at risk for being chronic, chronically absent, and we're celebrating them when they come in. And if they are at risk or chronically absent, we're developing individualized plans to support the families and to support the students in coming back to school. And of course, we're ultimately celebrating the progress and our success as demonstrated previously by our numbers going down. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I know in within the agenda, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the celebration, Nick, I appreciate it. Um, if you look at the agenda, you'll see the link to D13's website. All of the 13 schools are there. You'll see some of the, their social media posts, right? So these are some of the things that we're highlighting as celebrations around attendance, around academic progress. So those things show you or give you a glimpse of how we celebrate this progress. And again, make the environment welcoming for all learners. So how can you help? Yes. <laughs> Um, District 13 happens to be located where we have at least four medical hospitals. Um, we have colleges within the area. Um, and we have multiple businesses that ran ethnicities, um, industry, and the like. So we really are coming to you guys just to leverage influence. Finance is a lot a lovely, but influence is even greater. Your influence will give schools in District 13 an opportunity to leverage celebrations. It would be amazing for parents that were formerly chronically absent but are now less chronically absent to get a dinner at the end of the month of April at Applebee's. You know, your influence would be essential or dinner or groceries, you know, that kind of handout or success mentors at the college level, you know, just knowing that District 13 would love to have those partnerships where students in college that are doing community service can become a mentor for students that are struggling with absences. If we can get them in, it would be beneficial. Your influence again, even around laundry mats. We did some research previously last year during the pandemic, Clean Right has a program, but the nearest Clean Right is five miles away. 
But if there was a network of launder, launders that would allow a discount card for District 13 students to get their clothes washed or uniforms washed, that would be beneficial as well. Um, reliable transportation, most students walk, um, and just probably partnerships with the housing authority or condo communities or apartment buildings around developing neighbors that come to school together and walk back. Something as simple as that, maybe something that would be very helpful and appreciative. Um, and I think that's it for me. I think I hit every point so far on this PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. So there was one um, uh, other influence that I'd like to add in that um, bringing additional clinics to the area. And many times students are absent because of doctor visits. And so it would be key to message to families and clinics to possibly provide hours in the evening or times around the school day so that missing school is not necessary in order to visit the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I am going to stop sharing right here. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I, I, I really, you know, one of our standard questions is how can we help? And so we really appreciate you already elevating that for us. And um, if you haven't sent the slides, please do. So I wanna open it up to folks for questions, the committee for any questions you may have. Comments? Okay, what about anybody? Yeah, open it up, Ms. Falk, go ahead. Yes, um, if one wants to help, how do we, who do we contact and how? We need to have that information, I think. So I would definitely defer to the District 13 Attendance Coordinator, Sylvia, who's online. If you can drop your email in the chat, that would be beneficial, Sylvia. If, if you could drop it, because I'm on my phone and I'll I never you. know how to do Zoom <laughs> on my phone. My apologies, <laughs> um, but yes, absolutely. You can reach out to me. Um, I'm absolutely open to building and fostering partnerships um, for the District 13 school. So can you, just for say, can you just say your email so we can write it? Oh, sure, sure. It's S is in Sam Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-C-E, the number four at school, dot nyc dot gov at schools s c h o o l s yes plural yes not say that not dot n y yes dot gov dot and it's in the chat for you miss Falk, right there okay. perfect okay. okay it's the last okay. one you're very okay. welcome you're very welcome okay and Tay, I just wanted to elevate in the chat, uh, thanking you all for the data with the relationship between asthma, absenteeism, DQE, transportation. Saw that location, location, location um, slide. So, so I guess this has me just thinking, and, and I would throw it back to you, Principal, um, maybe Bishop and um, Ms. Wallace Anderson. We're always thinking of ways to support the community. And I know last year there was a a huge, amazing, uh, the health committee had an awesome fair uh, with bringing a lot of, of community folks together, um, health, to your point, health institutions, right? And um, it, it was a really successful event. So I think we're thinking of ways to maybe do that related to this committee and or other committees. It feels like there's synergy between transportation already you're elevating and health and us. So, um, it just sounds, it sounds like there's a good conversation to come and would you be willing to participate in future planning maybe for a community event where we could help support chronic absenteeism with those three asks, for example, that you laid out, incentives, et cetera? Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, that's great. I, I personally appreciate it. Just, it felt very concrete and tangible and real. And I think sometimes we're always looking for ways to help uh, and and, so thank you. Anything else from the anyone here? Any questions or comments? I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, is was there? I, I'm just trying to understand where where which is the the data with the relationship between the asthma and the BQE. Um, Tay, I think you mentioned it, but I don't know which link it is. 
Um, Ms. Bishop, uh, maybe you could show that slide one more time. That's not a problem. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to say, I particularly appreciate that. I, it's a great single slide visual of something that is not being discussed enough in the BQE development conversations. Mm -hmm. Just two seconds. I moved away from it. There we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Not a problem. And let me open it up. I'm going to go into presentation mode so you can see it clearly. Thank you. You're welcome. Taking a quick screenshot. Got it. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes, and Taya put info about the health fair previously that I referenced if you wanted some context. Uh, about that past event. Great. So thank you again. We really, really, really appreciate your time. We know you've been, you know, up since maybe before the sun and <laughs> working yeah. hard all day. And we <laughs> appreciate you. I'm officially leaving the building. Uh, yeah, coming <laughs> as the sun goes down. So thank you. And you're always welcome if you're not on the agenda to come and even just give us an update uh, on how things are going or what, what you need, you know, from us. But we are going to engage you. For, for this, so. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you Appreciate guys. Have a good night. All right, so um, we're gonna move on now to our next presentation from Pop Up Forest Wildflower Week School Campaign. Uh, Miss Anzalone, is that right? Anzalone? My apologies if I got your name wrong. Hi, I'm here, but it doesn't Hi. look like Am I showing up in the video? It doesn't look like it. No, you're you're a blank screen right now. Oh, sorry. Hopefully at some point it'll um oh I see I have my little spinning wheel. Um virtual oh. Okay, let's see. I'm so sorry. Something's going on with my video. It's okay. Um no worries. Yeah, so just bear with me for a second, but I'm really glad to be here. I know you all have a really packed agenda. So as soon as my te uh, technical difficulties and... Um, and we can hear you clearly, just so you know. Right, so okay. You, you know, just wanted to share. Oh, good, oh, nope, there, there I are. am, ta-da. <laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, oh gosh, and I have this light on. I'm gonna turn this off, so that's a little bit better. Um, that's okay. You don't need to see my face anyway, because the real thing is that I'm going to be sharing my screen and show you um, what I'm working on. So I wear a number of different. So first of all, my name is Marielle Anzalon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really um, excited to be here. And what I want to share with you is this campaign that was just launched yesterday, and I'm going to be sharing my screen. Let's see. Uh, I think it's this one. Yes. Let's see. So did that come up? No, not yet. It's it's just started. It should load okay. in just a second. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, super duper. And could, um, could you enter full screen, please? We can actually see your entire computer right now. Oh, we you just can. I okay. just want to full screen that one browser window. All right. Okay. Um, I, if you click in the okay. upper left corner. The upper left corner. Is it a stop share first thing or? Uh, can yeah, do let me do that. Um, okay. The upper left corner where I'm sorry. That's okay. So go okay. ahead. And when I do it, it opens to full screen. I'm not sure how, why this That's is. That's okay, Ms. Anzalone. We're right here to support you. So go ahead and click, <laughs> Thank share, you. click share screen first, and then be okay. sure that you select uh, just the window that you want to share, not the entire computer screen. Right. Oh, I see. So that must have been what I did. Thanks for explaining that. No problem. Okay. Um, share screen. You are not alone in that. I we have been using this at work for three years, and don't Our worry, Fox. people still. Yeah. Struggle. So this is what I did last time too. I am just 
I'm trying to queue up Firefox. So because this is, I'm just showing the live website. Uh, so hopefully, let's see. Miss Ancelone, oh. if, if you're just trying to share a website, we might be able to help you out. Oh, actually, that looks perfect. Okay, great. I don't, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't know why that wasn't working before. So at any rate, sorry about that. And thank you for your patience and walking me through. So my work, I'm a botanist, and I used to work for the Department of Parks. So I know you're thinking, why isn't she talking to the Parks Committee? Um, but I really specifically am targeting education committees and youth committees, because I'm really keen to get this program initiative in front of as many kids as possible because i'm hoping that it will lead to a discussion where we're able to have more tools in new york city public schools for students to learn about the local environment typically when they learn about um, they have their living environment classes they tend to be very globally focused and i think that that's problematic for a lot of different reasons um, which I can get into later. But so to pivot back to what I'm doing is so yesterday was the first full day of spring. So happy spring, everyone. And um, my organization is New York City Wildflower Week. And we partnered with organizations across the five boroughs to launch a campaign for a New York City wildflower to have to come up with an official wildflower for New York City. And in the past, there have been comparable initiatives, but they've typically been done behind closed doors. And all of a sudden, you know, there's just like, like, for example, we have a city wildflower, uh, which is a daffodil, but it was just sort of put out there um, and no one really got a chance to talk about it. Um, and I think given where we are in the climate crisis, you know, thinking globally, acting locally, thinking about climate crisis and the extinction crisis, that we should be thinking about the ways in which a having an official city wildflower would really serve us and would help broaden the conversation with regard to what the city's focused on. So as you all know, the city has done a really good job of talking about the climate crisis where it has done a far less good job is talking about the global extinction crisis and in fact as you can imagine these crises are intertwined but the but the solutions to one do not guarantee solutions to the other so there are a number of concerns where, um, you know, solutions for for um, climate would not be suitable as solutions for addressing global biodiversity loss, um, which is indeed an issue. And especially, you know, probably where your community board is, maybe in some regards, you'd think like, we don't really have these kinds of issues. But in fact, New York City is I think the um, the city in the United States that has the largest amount, largest percentage of parkland, a lot of city parkland is actually open space and natural area. So these were areas that are largely um, forested or their grasslands or their beaches. And that's where we harbor a lot of our um, native flora. So spaces like that that are in Brooklyn would be Marine Park and small parts of Prospect Park. Prospect Park is a lot like Central Park in that it's a construct. So it was built from scratch and a lot of different species were brought in. Um, so native plants would be then the plants that have, okay, quick geology talk. So New York City used to be covered by a glacier. And in fact, New York City was only basically half of it, its current size. And the glacier melted uh, and over 18,000 years, the, the glacier melted. After it melted, 18,000 years went by, it's a long time. As the glacier was here though, and it moved across what is now the United States, it was grinding up um, rocks and particles. And then finally it just stopped where New York City is now and melted. And in melting, it created more land mass for New York City. So parts of New York City, um, okay, Vinegar Hill, right? What does that infer? Topology, that there's a height 
Brooklyn Heights. So there's something going on that's higher than the rest of the landscape. I live in Kensington and then just south of me is Flatlands, Flatbush. So that topography difference is the terminal moraine. That's where the glacier stopped and melted. So I'm living on melted glacier uh, and that makes it flatter. And um, so the height is where the glacier was. So once the glacier disappeared, there was nothing growing. Over 18,000 years, plants kept coming in and plants have these really tight, important, critical ecological connectivity to fungi, to local wildlife, which includes vertebrates and invertebrates like insects. Um, to uh, bacteria and all of these different things, creating this kind of like biological soup that has been adapted over thousands of years. So, you know, it's kind of a lot of info, but just to say that's why native plants are so important. And by and large, when New York City has this narrative about itself, nature is never part of it. But we have so much nature. And, you know, as someone who knows these natural areas well, it's just it's sad that we don't talk more about it. Um, so that's what this campaign is. It's a campaign to educate. It's a campaign to engage. It's a campaign to drive interest and connection. So back to the website. Um, so as you can see, the, we have a lot of really beautiful plants. This is the home page. And I really wanted it to focus on this idea of it being a campaign. Since we just came through the 2021 election cycle, that was really the, the inspiration for this. It was really great to see the way that New Yorkers got really invested in who was gonna win, um, you know, local council elections and the mayoral election. So I really wanted to capture, kind of bottle that spirit and put it into this. So the civic engagement part of this campaign is really important to me. We have our own logo, just like any good campaign should. Um, and so here are the candidates. So you'll see there's five candidates. There's one for every borough. Um, butterfly weed is Manhattan. Pinkster azalea is Staten Island. Giant sunflower is Queens. Um, there's wild columbine. Space bush is the Bronx. Wild columbine is Brooklyn. So let's click on that and find out where this takes us. This, well, I know where this takes us. It takes us to page number two. So. But it brings you to this spot here where it talks more about wild columbine. And now this information is represented um, four more times on this page for the others. But we're just going to do a deeper dive into Brooklyn. So the Brooklyn partner is Brooklyn Bridge Park, which, of course, is housed at least in part in your community board, your community board district. Um, and they have been absolutely delightful. Big shout out to Brooklyn Bridge Park for being a tremendous partner in this. Um, so you can see that there's information. You can pop down the menu and keep reading about why it's so awesome and why they chose it. And then um, you can pop into, we're going to scroll up a little bit. You can pop into the window here and um, go through and see why it's so great. Um, and I have a little narrative underneath each one of the windows. So, and then you can press vote and vote will take you up to the top of the page. No one will know how you voted. So even though you are part of a community board in Brooklyn, if you're feeling really like you just have to vote for the Bronx representative, you totally can. There is no shame in that and no one will know. Um, and so you type in an email address and zip code and then just click to vote. And the email address in this part is only to have one email one vote we don't want people voting multiple times but it's not like a foolproof system and then if you want to sign up for the mailing list that's a separate um that's a separate set of clicks so this will not set, will not um select you into the mailing list because i really do want students to also get excited about this and be able to vote and i don't want anyone like 10 year olds to feel overwhelmed by the fact that they're going to have to be on this mailing list. We're not doing any of that. 
So then we'll go to visit the last page. What are three more things you can do? And then this is to me where I get into sort of more of the meat as to why, um, you know, why this campaign, why vote for a wildflower? So this is a little bit of what I talked about earlier, that it's really an education and awareness campaign. We want to connect New Yorkers to our wild flora. And I know it's not something, again, that we talk about in present day, but in fact, New York City is a very well botanized city. We have historical records that go back hundreds of years. And um, the New York Botanical Garden, which is in the Bronx, was actually started by a famous botanist who grew up in Staten Island um, and then went to Columbia College, which of course is now Columbia University, and went further afield to create this botanic garden. I think it actually might have first been part of Columbia and then they moved it to the Bronx later. Um, and so there's a really rich history of botanizing in New York City. And I wanna, um, again, try to capture a little bit of that and get New Yorkers really excited about local flora. Um, so these are three ways here that I've outlined that people can help as individuals. I'm also going to be, um, doing walks throughout the year um and i'm realizing i don't have that connected i'm just going to write this down connect walks um i did this mostly by myself and this was a little bit overwhelming my new york city wildflower week organization is really just me i have a fiscal sponsor um but i uh it's the work that I've done since I left the Parks Department where I'm really trying to advocate for flora. There are advocates for birds. Birds get a lot of attention and love. And I'm sure some of you in this call really also like birds. And it might interest you to know that people put out bird feeders, people have bushes with berries on them and thinking like, my birds love these berries. But really, birds come from native plants. How is that possible? Well, I'll tell you that if you don't know, I'm going to tell you about Douglas Tallamy a little bit, and I can drop his name. Chris Anzalone, I got to just give you one more minute, and then sure. we want to open oh, it up Oh, I'm so questions. sorry. Okay. okay. So, no, it's okay. It's okay. So, I just want to so just... set some time so you, yes. so you can no, prioritize thank you. what you want to share. Of course. So, um, so for Douglas Tallamy, he talks about how native plants are feeding native birds because they support hundreds of species of insects, and caterpillars especially feed on native plants and those are food for baby birds so if we don't have caterpillars in the landscape we won't have the next generation of birds so that's why native plants are so important and we're really trying to highlight and focus on that um so i guess you know then the the ask for the community board would be um one i'm going to circle back to um the the main group and do you know like a two minute presentation there and also looking to do be included in an e-blast but i'm wondering if you have ideas or suggestions aside from contacting the cecs who i would talk to what schools might be interested in having me come in to discuss these issues um and also just different organizations that might be willing to engage and help further the message we want to get as many new yorkers as possible to vote and then to come on some of these wildflower walks and to be thinking more about wildflowers and that's it thank you so much thank thank you miss Anzalone. so any um questions from the committee first No. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, I think, um, Ms. Anzalone, Taya, if I'm correct, maybe we could be sharing out just through a blast maybe to our partner or something. Yes. So that we can, you know, connect you more at large um, to our audience and then um, potentially, as we were mentioning before, as we plan some events and try and connect community members, we're going to reach out to folks who've presented and give them an opportunity to be a part um, of what we may be putting together. 
Okay, sure. And um, other other CBs have mentioned um, like open street programs or other things that are going on. So this campaign runs through November. So we have lots of time to really like dig in and and have these conversations. So just, you know, as you're thinking, um, if something comes up, I would love to, um, you know, know about it um, and hear more about how I can really engage the neighborhoods in your community to um, to really get on board. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate yes. everybody's time and patience. Absolutely. Have a wonderful night. You too. Thank you. And of course, you're welcome to stay if you want. Um, and we will, so I guess we would be moving on to the chairperson's report. Uh, Betty is not with us this evening. And so, Taya, I don't know if there's anything planned to share or if we would be moving on. We can move on, or if you have anything you'd like to share, please feel free. <laughs> I am good personally. Uh, thank you, sharing. Um, but I believe then we can move on to other committee business. And I do believe, Ellis, uh, you have something that you wanted to share with us? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm following up on something that we discussed at our last meeting. We discussed uh, the plant. Uh, uh, budget cuts for the Brooklyn Public Library. And uh, just so you all know, I am a card carrying member of the Brooklyn Public Library. And I hope that if you are not tonight, that you I will make you so excited that you run to your local library tomorrow and get your own card. Um, you know, libraries are, are more than just about books. They help strengthen communities, and they help create a more literate and just society. And our Brooklyn Public Library has been doing this work for 125 years. And so in order to kind of prep for tonight, I went to look and to see what their mission and vision was. And I, am, I just wanna go to what the BPL's vision is for themselves. Um, they can, they, uh, want to be a vital center of knowledge for all, accessible 24 hours a day, a leader in traditional and innovative services, and uh, which reflect the diverse and dynamic spirit of the people of Brooklyn. And they are really doing that work. They are a crucial provider of necessary services to the full age range of people and, and all the people that, that live with us in Brooklyn. Libraries in uh, our community district are uh, really inclusive. They make resources and programs available to all the visitors. And what is interesting about the libraries in community school district, uh, community, bleh, community district two is that, uh, the libraries all have a very different flavor, but I find I find that all over Brooklyn actually. But I just want to talk about ours, and we are uh, we are kind of fortunate because we have some really strong branches. If you come to our um, to our full board meetings, you hear they, uh, the librarians come and they present and they talk about all the great things. Let me tell you, they're only telling you part of the stuff. Check them out on Facebook. I know that might be a little old school, but I still have a Facebook account. I check them out. They have interesting programs. And, uh, you know, the website is interesting as well, but Facebook feels a little bit more accessible to me. And I just want to mention our branches that we have here. We have Walt, Mit Walt Whitman, which is in a historical uh, building. It is next to three public schools that are housed in one building, and it's inside the area of the Ingersoll houses. Uh, then we have my personal library, Clinton Hill. It was built in 1973 to meet the needs of Clinton Hill and Fort Greene. And it supports the community with job search, uh, computer, computer skills, and they have lots of arts and crafts for the entire lifespan. 
And I just found out, I think that they, what they have there, yoga or Pilates, it doesn't matter. It's all healthy for you. Then we have the uh, Adams Street Library and that uh, it is located in the Dumbo area. And that is located in a former torpedo factory. Who knew? I didn't know. I just found that out. And uh, that the torpedo factory turned into a plastic re recycling plant. And now it's turned into a library, serves Vinegar Hill, Farragut Houses, Dumbo. They provide homework help. They're strong in their team programming, arts and crafts for the lifespan. And they have a robotics team that is competitive with other robotics teams from libraries. Um, we have, and that is, a, you know, the Adam Street is a, is a new library, fairly new. Then we have Catman Plaza, a new library in an old spot. It is in downtown, it's accessible to public transportation has lots of team programming, including something that as a former, uh, as a former principal, something makes me a little bit queasy, but it's all working out great. They have team programming where once a month on Friday afternoon, after the library closes, teams take over that library, no adults allowed, and they plan their own programs, snacks and activities and all great things. And um, then we have um, the, what is now called the Center for Brooklyn, which I remember as the uh, Brooklyn Historical Society on uh, Pierpont Street. It's currently not open, it's under construction, uh, but it has extensive, extensive documentation about the history of Brooklyn, the buildings and the people. Um, and in addition to that, they have very cool book talks and panel discussions. And right now, because the building is closed, all of that is virtual, so it's very easy to attend. And then uh, we have, so we another branch that is not open, but will open soon, is our new branch that will be at L10, which is on Lafayette and, um, Flatbush across from the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And there will be a small library there, which will be complementary to the arts organizations, to museums of the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Arts, Brooklyn Academy of Music, and 615 Arts. So that gives you an idea of the range of services that these. Uh, libraries, these branches provide for us. Currently, there is a $13 million cut for libraries planned for this year, an additional cut of 20 million for next year. These cuts will absolutely have a direct impact on service. And what good is having all this good stuff if libraries have to cut their hours, have to cut their staff, all these resources that are available to all of us um, will no longer be as available. So what I am proposing to the committee and what I'm asking for for the committee is I'm asking you to vote on a, uh, I'm doing my best here on a proposal to, um, to request that the full board approve a strong letter of support for the Brooklyn Public Library. And that is my presentation. I know Nick is gonna ask Thank more you questions. Thank you for so that, open to that. That was great. I didn't know you were a former principal and if I did, I, I forgot. So, thank you. Um, that was really great. That was awesome. I learned a lot. So we have a, a request. Does that mean we need a, a motion, a second, Taya, on this request? That's exactly right. Okay, winging it. I saw yes. Leroy, I think, hand go, <laughs> go up as the second. And so then this is just a vote to, I guess, approve, but is it comments first? Any 
questions or comments for Ellis before we vote? Santiago? I don't have any questions, but was there a formal motion made? I saw a highlight by Taya, but so want to, we want to say that again, Ellis, we're requesting a strongly worded proposal. A strongly uh, worded uh, letter of support for the Brooklyn Public Library. And we will, we will be joined. I mean, there's a lot of people supporting the library, but I think that this is not, I think that this is the time for us to speak up. So, and yes, in the chat again, a, a motion um, to recommend full board for a letter of support for Brooklyn Public Library funding. I did have a question on um, the library's maybe just involvement or input in the letter going forward, maybe, or any input you've gotten thus far, because they are very active. They do come to the general board. So I didn't know if we wanted to consider their input in whatever we put together, wording it in such a way. Actually, uh, they are, they have, uh... They're actually requesting people to write letters, but to write letters to their politicians. So uh, we had, you know, I had this dream that they were going to come and talk to you tonight so that I wouldn't have to do it. But it turns out that uh, probably many of the community boards, you know, are, are involved in these discussions as well. And they just don't have the staff to come to all of us. So. I have really, even in this presentation, I have largely dependent, uh, depended on, uh, on their materials that they have put out there, except for my editorial comments, which were all mine. Thank you. And Taya, you are sharing their, uh, there we go, a way that we can uh, send a letter to support. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Don't let uh, don't let uh, that the board is going to write letter. Don't let that stop you from writing individual right. letters. You know, don't hold back. Friends and families, get them to write letters. Libraries are that important. And I think that's what the uh, we do. Taya put in the chat. We have the link to this that we're seeing, mm -hmm. so that um, folks can on their own show uh, support as, as our neighbors and citizens. Ms. Pass, you had your hand up digitally. I didn't know if you wanted to ask something and then we were gonna um, move to vote. Oh, no, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, I, my, sorry, good evening, everybody. My name is Shani Pass. I'm actually a member of the District 13 uh, Community Education Council. And I just wanted to um, really throw my support behind the initiative to write letters. I thought, I think that's a great idea. So I just wanted to really reiterate that literacy is extremely important. Um, I think we could use more resources, not cuts to our resources to our library. So um, I just wanted to say that, especially as, you know, on behalf of my seat on the uh, Community Education Council and really see, you know, uh, um, ask my members, my uh, colleagues um, about maybe writing a letter as well um, as the CEC. So thank you so much for that idea. And, and thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Okay, so I um so then I guess we are ready to vote on this um motion. So we have uh who supports the uh recommendation, the motion to have a um full board letter of support for our Brooklyn Public Library funding. You can raise a digital hand, your regular hand. Okay, any opposition to that? If you just put down your hands real quick. Mr. Ferrer, I, I just wanted to check. I, I do see a Lisa on the line and I'm just wondering if that's our board member, Ms. Scott. Yes, it is. Hello, you. how are you? Okay, we, we just wanted to make sure to register your vote. I'm sorry, Ms. Scott, welcome. My apologies. No problem, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Anyone apps? If so opposed, just want to make sure. And abstaining. Right. And I'm a yes. So 
motion passes. Thank can you, I, Ellis. Yeah, uh, please. Can I say I I just wanna I just wanna thank my colleagues on uh, on this committee for standing behind this. And I think it like it it will really the fact that uh, everybody agreed and there's no opposals or whatever. Uh, I think that puts us in a really strong place when we present uh, to the board, to the full board. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so any um, other uh, committee business to share? Hey everyone, this is Samantha. Um, just wanted to give an announcement for um, everyone. There is a Know Your Rights training that the council member, the Congresswoman, as well as Assembly and Senator Brisport, well, Brisport is hosting um, for NYCHA residents in the developments in the Fort Greene area. Um, it will be on Friday from 6 to 8 p.m. at the community center. And then there is a gang database workshop that will be on the 31st at the community center as well from 6 to 8 p.m. 6.30, excuse me, to 8 p.m. Um, and it's being hosted by Legal Aid Society. Hosted, um, they're, they're gonna be doing the workshop and Jabari Bridgeport is hosting it. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Okay, so then I open it up to the community, to uh, our visitors, our guests, our neighbors. Anything you would like to share? If so, we would keep to the standard uh, two minutes if you could. But anything you want to share with us? Just doing some technology wait time, trying to respect the mute button and the the, the reaction hands. And <laughs> okay, hearing none, then do we have a motion to adjourn for the evening? I'll make a motion, Samantha. Right, and I think uh, I don't know, Santia Ellis. I don't know who was who was quicker. We're both second. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, both of you. Seconded. We can share it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, very much. Uh, I appreciate all the conversation and seeing everybody, and have a wonderful evening.